head of our department, Professor H. Mal Somi, our respected speakers, Senior Professor Martin Oliver from the London University College, Professor Nagar Jun from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, dear colleagues and delegates who are attending this international webinar on evaluation in digital education, a perspective from higher education, I am Professor Linda Zohming Liani, a faculty and co-organizing secretary of today's program. I thank you all for attending this webinar today. Thank you, Dr. Linda. I'll also just introduce myself, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, our respected head of the department, our two eminent speakers, respected Professor Martin Oliver and respected Professor Nagarjun. Uh, respected faculty members, dear colleagues, and dear participants. I am Neetu Kaur from Department of Education, Mizoram University, and I welcome you all in this, today's webinar on the theme students evaluation in digital education, a perspective from higher education. Let me now take this opportunity to invite our head of the department, Professor H. Malswami, to welcome and also introduce our two eminent resource persons for the day. Ma'am, please. Uh, thank you, Nitu. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and a warm greetings on behalf of the Department of Education, Mizoram University. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome the Vice Chancellor of our university, Professor K. R. S. Sambasivarao, to our international webinar on student evaluation in digital uh, education, uh, a perspective from higher education. It is indeed a matter of great pleasure for all of us that he could be with us uh, in spite of his busy schedule. Uh, my welcome also goes to Professor J.K. Patnaik, who is the present Vice Chancellor of Mizoram University. We are really privileged that he could join us today on our international webinar on such an important topic. We feel extremely grateful and honored to welcome our speaker and resource person for today, Professor Martin Oliver, who is a senior professor in Education Technology, Institute of Education, Culture, Communication and Media, University College, London, Institute of Education, London, United Kingdom. Professor Martin uh, is the current Pro Director, Academic Development, UCL, and was the head of Department for Culture, Communication and Media, and the head of the Center for doctoral education, a role that included serving as faculty graduate tutor. He has degree in mathematics and philosophy and has moved on to the area of educational technology. His career has been a combination of teaching and service roles, working at various times as an educational developer, learning technologist, program leader, and head of the IOC's learning technologies unit. Uh, he has astounding total of uh, 164 publications from 1997 till uh, this year, that is 2021. And his research mainly focuses on the use of technology in education. He has completely, uh, he has completed 12, year, uh, 12 research activities so far and has a number of achievements in his belt, including that of National Teaching Fellow in the United Kingdom. His research addresses the design and evaluation of the curriculum in higher education, drawing on work from the philosophy of technology and the field of science and technology studies. He has edited journals, including learning, media, and technology, and has research in learning technology. He has been the president of the United Kingdom's Association for Learning Technology and was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship by the United Kingdom's Higher Education Academy. He is particularly interested in work that explores foundational issues around theory and methodology. He has also undertaken work on evaluation and on digital games and learning. All of these and being a prolific speaker makes him an ideal resource person for today's webinar. Uh, today, Professor Martin Oliver will be speaking on the topic, understanding students' experiences in digital education. 
I would also like to welcome another speaker and resource person for today, Professor Nagarjun G, who is a retired senior professor, Homi Baba Center for Science Education, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, Maharashtra. Uh, Professor Nag uh, Nagarjuna Gadiraju did his MSc in biology and MA in philosophy from Mumbai and PhD in philosophy of science from IIT Kanpur. He just uh, retired in the month of uh, April this year, that is 2021. He has had an illustrious career and his major research interests include science education, cognitive science, history and philosophy of science and structure and dynamics of knowledge. He was the one who created an illustrated exhibition on history of science at Homi Baba Center for Science Education. As an activist he, uh, activist, he focuses on promoting free knowledge and free software and serves as the chairperson of Free Software Foundation of India. Professor Nagarjun has officially retired, but he is still very much active in research guidance and in academic pursuits like today's webinar. Uh, today, Professor Nagarjun will be talking on the topic, rethinking evaluation. Also, I should not forget to welcome our two organizing secretaries, Professor Linda Zomingliani and Dr. Nitu Kaur, Assistant Professor in the Department of Education, uh, Mizoram University. Without them, uh, our international webinar could not have materialized, thanks to both of them. Last but not the least, my very heartfelt welcome to all the participants of this international webinar on student evaluation in digital education, a perspective from higher education. I do welcome each and every one of you, and I really do hope that you will be with us during the whole webinar, and I hope uh, that all will be benefited by what we are about to listen. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Professor Merton Oliver, in the midst of this busy schedule, you have kindly consented to share with us your experience in digital education. And today, Professor Martin's topic will be understanding students' experiences in digital education. So we are so glad and fortunate to have you here with us in this international webinar. I welcome you again on behalf of all of us. And if you are ready, sir, uh, it is my pleasure to invite you to deliver your topic now. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored by the invitation and the very warm welcome you've given me. It, it's wonderful to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm very touched and humbled to see how many people have turned up and joined us. So I, I hope I can provide something which will at least be interesting and entertaining and I hope will help people with the work they're trying to undertake. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen so that you can see the slides that I've prepared for this. Um, I, yeah. Let me just see, okay. Um, yes, you can see your screen, sir. Yeah, it's for some reason jumped straight to the end of the talk. So that's a good start. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you can now see the starting screen um, and I'll proceed from here. Um, as we go through, um, if people do have questions, um, obviously there's a, a question channel you can ask questions in. I will make time at the end to respond to people. Um, what I want to do with this really is provide some ideas which might help people think differently about what it is you're evaluating and how you might evaluate it. Um, and I want to sort of frame this as something which obviously is shaped by our current experiences of the pandemic, but is not all about the pandemic. I want to put this into a wider context and I want to illustrate how the current challenges we face are part of an ongoing discussion around the relationship between technology and education. Um, and I want to sort of structure this talk in three parts. So there'll be part about this relationship, how technology relates to education, what happens when we bring them together. A section about how people design education and designing for learning rather than just for their own teaching. And a section at the end about locating academic work, which is something which is particularly important at the moment when all of a sudden lockdowns forced us to redistribute what happens traditionally on a campus. And I want to say that this is very much um, my experience. I'm aware that I am not the expert in what's happening with your students. I don't, I wouldn't want to presume 
the experience that you're having or the experience that your students are having, although I'm sure it's very challenging. So I offer this as, as part of a story um, where I think you are the experts who will have the other part. And I hope that this will open up a kind of conversation, a dialogue that will enable ideas to be shared between these different elements. So I want to start by thinking about how we can design a better experience for students, particularly during a pandemic, but not exclusively during the pandemic. And I think in order to point back to this broader conversation and put this into a context, I wanted to flag that there are things we already know about good curriculum design and these things still apply. So there are some well-established principles about how people design curricula. So for example, um, Big's work on constructive alignment and the backwash effect of assessment so that learners tend to do whatever is assessed and deprioritize anything that isn't assessed. So we know that there are things that learners do which are strategic, which are you know, well understood and which should shape the way in which we design our curricula anyway. And these things are still important and relevant. What's been added to this over the years are a lot of new ideas which are specifically focusing on technology and how technology has come into this picture, what role it plays in the curriculum design and in terms of the student experience. So there are many ways to talk about this, but I want to draw on one which I think is a relatively simple idea, but useful to, as a tool to think with, which is the idea of technological pedagogical content knowledge. That's something that's usually shortened to the acronym TPAC. So this derived from Shulman's work on pedagogic content knowledge in teacher education. So Shulman was concerned that when teachers were trained, they were often trained how to teach and they were often trained in their subject area, but they weren't necessarily trained in how to teach their subject area. So they might have general knowledge about how to teach and they might know mathematics, but that didn't mean they knew the specific ways in which mathematics was best taught. So he pointed to, he used a Venn diagram to show two circles of these different areas of knowledge and the intersection was the area he said that teacher education programs commonly neglected. And this helped to open up a new kind of conversation about what was later described as signature pedagogies for disciplines. So specific pedagogic approaches that relate to the kinds of disciplinary knowledge that was important when people were teaching. So that was the starting point. This idea has been developed by Mishra and Kohler, amongst others, um, to add this extra circle, which was about technology, and that creates new intersections between these areas. So it suggests we should be asking questions about what are the pedagogies of this subject, the signature pedagogies, but also what are the technologies that are used for teaching? What are the technologies of the subject? And what are the technologies for teaching this subject? So a technology of teaching might be something like Zoom in this webinar, or a virtual learning environment such as Blackboard or Moodle. Technologies of the subject might be things like, um, you know, a digital concordance for uh, teaching languages, or they might be a particle accelerator for theoretical physics, or it might be, you know, the, the chemicals that you work with in a chemistry lab, a wet lab. So what it starts to draw attention to is the way in which different technologies become important for specific kinds of disciplinary work. So one of the conversations just before this uh, webinar officially started was around the challenges that people have had in lab-based disciplines during the pandemic. And this lack of access to technologies forms part of that. The technologies of their subject are taken away from them. So this helps us to sort of think in more precise ways about what exactly the challenges of design are, but also some of the challenges about um, what happens under the lockdown. Now, I, I like, this is a quote from Diana Lorillard, who's a, a professor based also in the, the same area that I am at um, UCL, who's done a lot of work over the years around technology and design. And she had this quote, education is on the brink of being transformed through learning technologies However, it's been on that brink for some decades now. And she has this sense in which there's always this promise of a, a radical transformation of education by technology that never seems to arrive. We've been waiting for it for years. So there's always this sense in which something wonderful is about to happen, but we never quite get there. And one of the things that's really interesting about this is that it, it highlights how much has been achieved that we take for granted. So the fact that we're able to meet on Zoom with 200 or more participants in various different countries is quite amazing. And, you know, the pandemic has forced us to, to take this seriously, to think about this as an opportunity, but it would have been possible a year ago or two years ago. So there's a sense in which there are things which we aren't considering and also other things that we, we take for granted. So um, many places now 
assume that everyone will have access to an email account, whereas several years ago that wouldn't have been the case. So, you know, educational technology as a field has been operating since probably the sort of 1940s, 1950s. We've got 70 years of development of technology. It predates the internet. So many of these things which we now just assume are normal were once innovative, and we've kind of forgotten how transformational these things have actually been. One of the things which um, is a problem for the field of educational technology and also for evaluation is that um, trying to isolate the effect of technology is problematic. So there's a long body of work which points to what's called the no significant difference phenomenon, which is when you do comparative studies of, of conventional classroom based education with online education or distance education, there's rarely any difference in terms of the achievement of the students, either positive or negative from that. Where there are studies that have found differences, um, those differences tend to be very small. And they also tend to not be about the modality but about the change in the way that teaching happens. So the technology becomes um, an excuse to rethink the educational process and to do education better. So it's an opportunity for learning as a teacher, also as a learner. So a lot of the benefits come from having more time for learning and usually access to improved resources that wouldn't otherwise have been available. So they're not specifically caused by the technology, they're just associated with its introduction. There's also a problem with efficiency and technology. So again, a quote from Diana Lorillard, wherever we look around the globe or in our own backyards, we can see that more and better education is needed, but the scale of the problem cannot be tackled through our traditional te uh, technologies for teaching. When we measure student numbers in billions, staff student ratios of one to 30 make no impact at all. The problem of scale is challenging. And Diana's point with this is that um, much of the quality of education comes through interaction an interaction does not scale well. So it's relatively easy for me to talk at 200 of you. For me to have conversations with 200 of you would be much more difficult, but possibly much richer. So there is always this trade-off between what it's possible to achieve at scale, what it's possible to achieve easily, and what the benefit of that is for the people involved. So these are some framing issues, which I think put limits on and also some reinsurances about the move from a conventional model of teaching to what we're now experiencing. So students are not necessarily going to do worse because they're in a different modality. We may need to think about how the education process happens, but it's, we shouldn't assume the outcome is gonna be negative or positive. One of the things that um, has been seen a lot to do with technology is improvement of the experience for students. And sometimes, Quite often, the assumption is that increased flexibility is associated with the introduction of technology. So this is, um, there are various ways in which flexibility can be understood. But the idea is that improving the opportunities for learners to study in a flexible way will be beneficial to them, helpful to them. So here, the example of flexible learning in terms of frequency, timing, and duration, how they study, the modes of learning, and what they want so that they can pick the, the syllabus they work through, the topics that they're covered in the curriculum. Um, there are the, the, dis the discussions about kinds of flexibility has gone much further. So um, Nicolova and Collis have a paper where they talk about 19 different dimensions of flexibility, covering various aspects of time, such as when the course starts and finishes, how fast people progress through it, when the assessment takes place, as well as things like the sequencing of the topics, the number of activities they have to complete, how difficult it is, whether there are prerequisites for entry, um, different ways in which the instruction is organized, the format of the materials, the language is used, the kinds of support that people are offered and so on. So this is really helpful if you're a designer and you want to be challenged to think about, well, how could I design my course differently? Many people follow a pattern that's familiar to them one they've inherited from their own experience, from their, their own sort of studies as a student themselves, thinking about um, what they could do next, what they could create that would be innovative these kind of things can be helpful in suggesting new ways of organizing the educational experience. However, there is an issue here in terms of whose responsibility it is to make those designs and to make them happen. So, you know, I would argue there's a shared responsibility. Um, the idea that all of this is for the students can be a problem. Students don't necessarily want or understand 
the responsibility for all these different idea uh, parts of the curriculum design process. As educators, we should have expertise. We should have developed expertise, we should have thought about the design and we should have something to offer the students so that we can say, well, look, you can do it all these different kinds of ways. But honestly, if you try and combine it in that way, it's gonna be a problem because. Whereas if you do it this way, it might help you through because. So that sense in which we can understand what the different combinations might achieve, what the meaning of those choices will be, and to have a dialogue with the students about which ones will actually work for them. Now this requires us to know about our students. And this is something I'm gonna keep coming back to through this talk. There's also a challenge if students get to design the programs they want, where does that leave us as people responsible for delivering it to them? You know, if there are 19 different dimensions of flexibility and there's several different options within each of those, we're talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands of possible kinds of course design. Most places can only offer a handful of courses. So there is then a strategic choice about, well, which kinds of design will help the greatest number of students? Where is the compromise to be achieved? So we have these opportunities. There is a challenge in terms of knowing which ones to pursue. We can't pursue all of them. There's also a sense in which higher education um, becomes involved in wider discussions um, about the pressures on students and particularly lifelong learners to act in certain ways. So there is this concern that the flexibility is a trap, not a benefit. So is this something students themselves are asking for or is this something that other people want students to ask for? So um, Sue Clegg did an analysis of the kind of policy discussions primarily in the UK, um, but across Europe as well. And her argument was the idea of this idea of the flexible student is not a spontaneous occurrence. Students have been engineered to become more flexible as a result of policies that have put more financial pressures on them to work in particular ways. It's also created the conditions under which the only way for many adults to access higher education is via flexible modes of delivery. In this sense, students are forced to become flexible and the flexibility they're supposed to conform to is a particular predetermined set of learning practices or processes. So her argument there is that this is not really a choice for students. The suggestion that it's about student choice is misleading actually students have no choice in this they are required to work to study alongside a full-time job and managing their family and all the rest of it as an extra pressure in order to be exploited more efficiently in a neoliberal economy so there is a sense here in which the flexibility becomes not an asset but a necessary way of coping with your own lack of control of the situation so there's a talk which was done recently um, introducing the idea of Shomoyscapes, which was a development of the idea of timescapes as a way of explaining how in academic work people had to balance uh, pressures around time, the precarity of their position and the social hierarchy they were part of. So this was looking at in particular how activities were displaced through external pressures that people experienced as they tried to go about their academic work. So some of these were about the pressures of family, so the demands of taking children to school or caring for a parent. Some of it was about politics and being told you can't do that, you've got to do this instead because so and so wants it delivered now. And some of it was about practical things like how bad the traffic was in the city where they worked and how long it took them to get through the traffic jam from one meeting to another. But this sense in which people were having to be flexible as a response to things that were beyond their control is quite important and I think obviously quite relevant to the situation we're in now where the pandemic is something we can't control and we are in many cases legally obliged to work in different ways. Okay, so that's the first part of the conversation which has suggested some areas about technology and education, the relationships between them and some issues that come out of it. So what I want to move on to now is thinking, well, if these are the different kinds of decisions we need to take, the different things we need to take into account as we make our decisions, how do we design something for students learning rather than for our teaching? How do we design something that our students need rather than what suits us? So for this, um, I'm turning back to Diana Laurelard's work, um, and she introduced many years ago this idea of the conversational framework as a way of explaining how learning takes place. So it's only one model of learning. Um, it draws particularly on cybernetic theories. Um, so, you know, it, it's a very particular perspective. It's not the only model you can use. Um, but the reason I'm using it is because it's been used quite extensively in a field of work called learning design. 
So in this model, she differentiated between the teachers and the learners, and she framed education as a conversation in which teachers expressed things, learners asked questions, teachers clarified, learners responded, and so on. And also at the same time, working in parallel, a series of actions, activities, things that people did in practice. So teachers set tasks for learners to do, perhaps, you know, working in a laboratory, for example. Learners tried to undertake those tasks, teachers gave them feedback on it, and so on. There's also internal processes for the teacher and for the learner where they reflect on their experiences and adapt the teaching process and the learning process. So the idea is that this gives, um, again, a series of dimensions, a series of activities, a series of elements, which can be used to think in more precise ways about how learning takes place and what's needed for learning to take place. So this model was developed and it was used to analyze education um, in various settings, in evaluative ways as well, for a number of years. Um, but one of the things that Dan Lerlar did with this was develop a software tool called the Learning Designer. And this should be available, I think, um, still as an open source piece of software. Um, but the idea behind the model is very straightforward and I don't think it really needs the software to explain the idea. So the Learning Designer was a technical implementation of this conversational model. And it was there to do several things. First, it gave a language for talking about teaching. So it enabled teachers to explain how they were approaching the design of their course. And this elicitation of design created um, a repertoire of patterns. And those patterns were then shared. So this gave people a way of talking about their practice and sharing it with other people. But importantly, as part of that process, the description of what they did could be analyzed. It could be broken down in quite simple ways to think about, is what they were currently doing the best way to be teaching? So it would, the designer would draw on that model to prompt a series of questions such as, does the teaching you're proposing to do strike a balance between people working on their own, people working in groups, or being given resources that are the same for everybody? Is there um, an appropriate balance between getting information by being talked at, such as in a webinar or a lecture or reading, and opportunities to do things with that information? such as carrying out tasks, producing outputs, um, talking to people about it, practicing things. Can you work with it as well as hearing about it? Can you respond to it and get feedback on your understanding of it as well as being told about it? So at a very simple level, for example, this tool would generate um, pie charts showing the proportion of time that the teachers were proposing to spend on each of these different kinds of things, getting people to, to read or listen, getting people to try things out, getting people to talk about stuff. And then they would be challenged with the question, is that balance appropriate for what you're trying to achieve? So this was a way of evaluating teaching designs, and it was a very simple way. It's a, a sort of heuristic that people can use, but nonetheless is there to encourage re reflection, encourage um, consideration of alternatives. If you analyze your teaching and think, really, I'm spending almost all my time telling people things, I'm not giving them an opportunity to think about it or practice it, maybe I ought to change the designs so that people have more time for practice. And then you get into conversations about designing better experiences for the learners. So to illustrate this, you know, this, we're in a webinar now where I'm spending most of this time talking at you. We're going to have time at the end for questions, but there is a question here from the learning designer about whether I'm spending too much time telling you things, whether you're having the chance to see whether you've understood what I'm explaining, whether you've got any opportunity to try these things out, whether I'm differentiating this at all or treating you all in the same way, whether I'm respecting the difference and diversity in the audience. And so there's a question here about what could be added to something like this that would make it a more balanced experience. So this encourages us to think, you know, all of us, me included, about the ways in which we approach all of these tasks as we go through our educational work. I want to wrap this section up by looking at one of the other models for designing for learning. So I spent a lot of time looking at Diana's work, but I want to put this into context by looking at another. And this one um, had a slightly different idea of how learning took place which is a useful bridge to the next section of the talk. So in this model, um, the emphasis was very much on um, taking into account the needs and experiences of the learner. So Diana's model is very much about what the teacher designs. This model was much more about who the learner is and what they need. So this was trying to draw attention to, yes, what needs to be learned as the other models were, but also to the histories of the learners you were trying to teach. Who else might need to be working with them as they were trying to study? 
and what resources that they needed to study with, including the places where learning happened. So it's drawing attention to something that is kind of hidden in Diana's model. In the activity section, the practical section at the bottom of that figure, there is this sense in which learning takes place somewhere and with some things, but it doesn't really draw attention to that. These other models started to bring in this sense of place in quite an important way. So this is where I'm going to move into the third section of the talk, which is about, I've called it locating academic work. So this is really trying to think about the question, what do we know about where academic work is happening and who and what are involved in that process? So there are some obvious examples, you know, we're very familiar with the idea of the, the lecture. This is why I've picked this particular picture. Most of these illustrations, by the way, are sort of generic um, uh, images from a photo sharing site. I've got the links in the slide notes and the slides will be available afterwards. Um, but they're there to illustrate some of the sort of assumptions we might have around teaching. And this one in particular is a very conventional model of stepped seats with a presenter at the front. And that, you know, when people think about university, when people think about higher education, they may well think of things like this. But actually this is not where a lot of learning happens. This might be where a lot of teaching happens, but it's not where a lot of learning happens. So I want us to spend a little bit of time thinking about what makes the campus important, what we've lost during the pandemic, but also what happens and where when students try and study. So some analysis that I thought was really interesting around the campus as a resource came from this work by Cornford and Pollock. And they talk about the you know there's a lot of talk about the digital university um, disaggregating the university the university of the future being distributed and their argument was that the campus or more generally the co-location of learners teachers labs classrooms lecture theaters libraries and so on refuses to lie down and die those seeking to develop distributed education should understand the support a campus setting gives the educational process and should be prepared for the necessity to find new ways of providing that support in a distributed, edu distributed education context. So for them, there's something really important about having people come together, about having the lab near to the library, about being able to move between the practical work and the theoretical work in quite a, a straightforward and seamless way. And this illustrates from a theoretical, what theoretically has been described as a socio-material perspective on education. So this is bringing the idea that education is a social process, but also the idea that it's a material process. So one of the introductory uh, comments before this, uh, the, the beginning of this webinar was about the, the webinar materializing. And I thought that was particularly appropriate because you know, it, it's here, it's appeared in front of us, but it's appeared in front of us probably on a screen of a digital device and we're sat in a room. In my case, what you can't see hidden in the background are piles of laundry and there's a table and there's, you know, a door to stop the cats getting in and the children, keep the children out. There's all sorts of things around this which are material. So these social material perspectives are about drawing attention to what happens in this material setting around what we think of as a, an intellectual process or a social process. So this uh, from Fenwick et al describes that interest. So humans do not float distinct in container-like contexts of education, such as classrooms or community sites that can be conceptualized and dismissed as simply a wash of material stuff and spaces. The things that assemble these contexts and incidentally the actions and bodies, including human ones that are part of these assemblages are continuously acting upon each other to bring forth and distribute as well as to obscure and deny knowledge. So these things matter in the sense of both being made of things, being made of matter, but also being important to how education happens and what is possible and what's not. So some work I did with um, Debbie Holly, uh, we were looking at the experiences of students in one of the courses that she taught and she did these biographical interviews with the students and used them as the basis of analysis. And in this excerpt, she talks about one of her students as a single mum who started university six years ago and had to quit when she became pregnant. The circumstances that allowed concentration to occur are typically when she had been able to split her time up and create a learning space. Sitting down is important in the peace and quiet of the university library away from home. So the space and freedom of this is liberating and she appreciates it far more now as a mature student than she did as a young undergraduate. She appreciates the online materials which help her create the circumstances where she can concentrate and she appreciates the IT studios where she can concentrate on her work. So you can see from this excerpt the importance for this particular student, this is still clip art, this isn't the student, um, but the importance for the student this narrative is about. 
um, in terms of having a space to go that's quiet, of being able to concentrate. And I think this is something when we talk about digital education, we tend to look at the devices, we tend to think about the teaching, the presentation. We don't think about how people make sense of the experiences they have in those kinds of settings. So this was drawing attention back to those very particular moments, the, the intensity of studying, of being a student, not just being a receiver of a lecture, and of thinking, the need for space to concentrate in order to really engage with really quite difficult ideas. So what was novel, this is also quotes from the same paper, was the importance of controlling spaces for learning. These accounts show how easily Charles, who was one of the other people she looked at, was able to colonize new spaces for study at home and online using principle from his work in industry. Now, Charles was a really privileged individual. He was quite rich, he lived alone, he had a flat to himself, and he talked about being able to spread his work out everywhere. Whereas for Joanne, she couldn't because she had a family around and other demands on her time and you know, the space was also other people's space. So the irony here uh, is that online learning materials have been created to support a widening participation agenda. So they're designed to bring in students who had previously been excluded. Yet in these cases, it was the traditional good student who benefited the most. So it's the people who already had privilege who already had control of resources and spaces, who benefited the most from these moves towards flexibility because it gave them even more choice. They could do, you know, they had even more options to do what they wanted to do. Whereas for other students, it might help a bit, or in some cases, it might actually create pressures on them to perform in certain ways they weren't comfortable with. Now, this is moving to a different study, which was looking at um, the experience of students, students in South Africa. And I apologize, it's a long quote. Um, I'll pull out the, the key points from this. So the research in this paper resists the simple narrative of the digital divide. And the argument here is that the digital divide, the sense in which some people have access to technology and others don't, deprives the students in, of agency. It ignores the ways in which students are able to act. So the findings here indicate that students make a plan so a metaphor drawn from the South African Afri Afrikaans expression, Mac and Plan, which connotes an ability to respond smartly to adverse circumstances. So they're looking at the resilience, the capability, the creativeness of their students. So students exhibit a more complex and nuanced way of engaging with the availability and of different kinds of technologies, as well as making considered decisions about ubiquitous using the ubiquitous technologies in unexpected ways. So here in particular, they were looking at how students use their mobile phone, even though it cost them a lot of money at the time of the study to do this because of the premium rates charged for the phone data tariffs to participate in education they would otherwise be excluded from. So the digital divide does not exhaust the explanatory possibilities. It merely describes the objective circumstances in which students as agents must live. So I think the important point here, which is still relevant today, and particularly in relation to the pandemic, is this idea that students still have the ability to act. They still are agentive. They still make things with the resources that are available to hand as best they can, they cope. So it may not be what they hope for, it may not be ideal, but I think we shouldn't underestimate what students are capable of. So in my own work, in a project led by Leslie Gourlay, who's a colleague of mine at UCL, uh, we did a study of students' experiences in terms of digital literacies. So how people are able to perform in a literate way in relation to their, their educational practice. And for us, it was really important that these experiences were seen as plural. So we wanted to see how students study, how they created, engaged with different kinds of texts, but we wanted to understand how these experiences differed, both in terms of each person having different experiences, depending on things like the resources available to them, but also for the same person at different times. So we didn't assume that one person had a single experience of education. We looked at their experience in this instance and then later on and so on. So we were not trying to make an average claim. We were not looking at the prevalence of these experiences. We wanted to understand the diversity of our students' experiences in a much richer way than we were able to do previously. So to do this, we used a technique of multimodal longitudinal journaling. So we asked students to go away and take photos of their studying, of where they studied, when they studied, what they studied with. And we also asked them to draw maps and pictures of their studying over a period of between six and 12 months. And they brought these to us and we interviewed them two or three times, I think in one case, four times about the images they brought to us. And then we did a standard thematic analysis of the transcripts from those interviews and we coded the images. 
And clipped at the bottom of this pitch, you can see one of the photos that a student brought to us. And I'll just talk this one through because I think it explains just how creative and resourceful students were. So the student brought this image along to an interview and explained that when she studied, um, she studied in the bath. So she first of all would buy books related to a course. She would then microwave those books to melt the glue along the spine and she would take all the pages out. She would put the pages through a high-speed scanner to create a digital copy of the book. She would load the digital copy of the book onto her iPad. She would put the iPad into a plastic bag, a transparent Ziploc plastic bag, so that she could still see it. And she would take that iPad in the bag into a bath. And for her, culturally, the bath was a really peaceful and tranquil space that created a good environment for her to, to read and engage with these difficult ideas. Now, this is not something any lecturer would ever design to support. It's not something we would take into account. But for her, this was an important part of how she was able to study successfully. This picture of the iPad balanced on the bath was an indicator of her being digitally literate, of using technologies to engage meaningfully in educational practices. So we also had these kind of sketch maps, um, just very quickly. This one shows someone running between two different um, buildings, which are actually parts of two different universities. Um, but also in there is the, the virtual learning environment in a cloud, which is a metaphor for it being distributed, pointing at particular rooms, the maths room here, other things, people and outdoors. But there's also, um, I think it's a picture of a bus, but underneath it says read on train. And the number of people who said to us, actually, a lot of my studying is done on public transport. It's done while I'm traveling to and from places. It's time when otherwise, it, otherwise the time would be wasted, but I'm able to read. And for them, this was a really important component that we'd often overlook. So it became very important to understand this so that we could make sure people gave students resources that were suitable for reading while on a, on a bus or on a train or on an airplane or whatever it was they were doing. So we did that. We, we studied students' experiences with that. We've used a similar kind of methodology um, in a project which was led by one of my colleagues, Alison Littlejohn, which was undertaken specifically at the, the start of the, the pandemic in the UK and the lockdown. It was studying how the academic work of staff at UCL changed when they moved online. So how do they carry on their work when the campus closes? So here we did a survey of, of people, but we also got them again to take photos of the home environments and we interviewed them about that, and analyzed those interviews. And the main thing that comes out is that just as with the students, they improvised, they did the best that they could with what they had to hand. So we had photos like the one I've shown here, which is a laptop balanced on a chair on top of a low table, but underneath you can see the person's yoga mat, you can see uh, the stress, but the inflatable ball behind the chair, which they might sit on while they're working. So they, they improvised these environments in order to carry on their academic work. So some important things that came out of the survey, over half the people who responded had caring responsibilities, which might be childcare, elder care, partners or family members. And also in terms of caring, um, many people were worried about the students' experiences and were trying to care for their students by giving them more attention than they might otherwise be able to do. Many people struggled to separate their work life from their home life. So their home offices had to be built and unbuilt many times through the day. So that sense of, you know, this balanced on a chair, well, maybe that chair was needed for something else. Lots of people would work on a kitchen table or a dining room table. Lots of people had teaching interrupted by pets, cats, children coming in and out. So there are always challenges for people about keeping these parts of their life separate. The other thing, which perhaps shouldn't be surprising, but indicates again the sense of privilege giving advantage, is that people who had larger houses were more positive about their experiences under lockdown. So if you had more rooms than people, if you could go somewhere and shut the door, they were happier with their experience under lockdown. So experiences of research split people. People who had who needed access to specialist equipment and to labs just could not undertake some of their work. It just had to stop. It became impossible to do it. However, some things which could take place in different locations, such as reading and writing, were easier for many people. They had more time to read than they had done previously because some of these other things had stopped, meetings had stopped. Writing, where they were writing on their own and not as part of a team, was often made easier. Teaching was really challenging because they needed to create spaces in which that teaching could happen and particularly being able to shut the door so they weren't interrupted as they were teaching. They also found it very difficult 
you know, and partly it's very nice to see a couple of faces on the Zoom gallery link here, because if you're talking to a screen with no sense of how people are responding, it makes it very hard to engage with an audience. You worry, you lose a sense of connection. So if all the students turned off their cameras, it became very hard to relate to that cohort. So, I mean, that's about staff experience, but I think it also raises questions that do help us to understand students' experiences and give us a clue about how we might evaluate those. So if students, if we find studying alone isolating, if we find working alone isolating, if students find studying alone isolating, what can we do that might bring them together? If staff need a private room when they teach, do students need a private room if we expect them to contribute? Will they be worried about turning on their cameras, about people interrupting them? If teachers worry about not seeing students and missing social cues because of the lack of cameras, are students worrying about what might be revealed when they turn their camera on? And you can see the room behind them. You can see what's happening in the rest of the house, who else is there, the circumstances in which they're living. The, the very sort of, in some cases, um, sort of indicators of privilege or lack of privilege might be put on display for everyone else in the class to see. So there's a lot of concerns here about um, you know, what it might mean for students to show themselves in that personal setting. So I'm going to stop the talk uh, with a couple of slides thinking about conclusions. So the point going back right to the start in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, learning with technology isn't necessarily either better or worse. But I think it is interesting to understand in more detail how it changes the experiences of education as teachers and as learners. One of the things which I think is really important, which I've tried to draw attention to, particularly in that last section of the talk, is that in order to evaluate, in order to assign value, to certain things, we need to understand what it is we're evaluating and how different people value it, how it's not just valuable to us, but might be valuable to students. So we need to understand the diversity of the experiences that students may be having. And I think it's really important not to lose sight of that diversity. If we're doing surveys and we're just looking at averages, we may be hiding the experiences of um, perhaps not the majority group, but smaller groups who may be structurally disadvantaged by particular decisions that we take. Yes, the pandemic has forced students and also staff to adapt and we do feel the loss. We worry about the students, we, we miss the spaces, we miss the social interactions with people. And we now have this additional struggle of separating the times and the spaces of our work and our life. But I think the thing which is reassuring through all the work that I've seen, all the work that I've pointed to here, is that people remain creative and are able and continue to make the best of the challenging situations they're in. <clears throat> so I don't think we should despair or give up hope. I think there's something positive that we can take from this and learn from it in terms of how education could be different in the future. But the important thing, the thing that I mentioned at the start and I want to return to at the end, is that I don't know quite how it's been for you and I don't know how it is for your students but I would challenge you to think about, do you know what it is like for your students? Do you really understand the challenges your students are currently facing? And if you can then understand that, what designs or support or resources could be provided by you or by other people that would help them to deal with that? Thank you. So I've made the slides available. Um, I've emailed them to Dr. Carr, and I think they'll be shared after the talk. The references are all in there, but they're there as a resource if people would like those. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. Thank you, Professor Martin. It was a wonderful presentation of yours, and you have given us special insight to students' experience, which we totally ignore as teachers. And there are questions. First, I also have a question, but I would like to first take can you switch on your video, please? Yeah, yeah. My video is on. Yes, sir. So there is one question which is by... Uh, so you are able to see the questions? Uh, yes, I've opened them up now. Yeah. One from Devamalia Banerjee. Uh, so... So, Today in this pan pandemic situation, it's becoming very tough to teach scientific concepts which require chalk and talk method and detailed explanation and cannot be taught only through sharing of PowerPoint presentations. How can this problem be solved? Okay, so yes, I mean, there are certain things which are much, much harder to do, um, you know, in these technologies. Um, maths, mathematical symbols, the way equations are formed is often a particular challenge. But I mean, there are certain subjects, I mean, you know, if you think about trying to teach calligraphy, you know, it'd be very hard to teach that with a keyboard. It's just not the point. Certain forms of art and practice. And again, this, this ties into some of the conversations earlier on about um, 
you know, the material infrastructure in which people uh, need to undertake the disciplinary work that they, they're engaging in. So, you know, if you're trying to teach chemistry, but you never get into a lab, it's a very difficult way to, to try and learn to be a chemist. Um, whether chalk and talk, I mean, I think we need to, to think about what it is that chalk and talk enables people to do. And I think one of the things that's really important is about showing the process of constructing knowledge. So you are performing the construction of knowledge as you are explaining it to the students. So in that sense, if there were some other, I mean, we can, for example, um, in some virtual learning environments, there's what they call the shared whiteboard function, where you're able to use a mouse to write on the screen. It's not as fluent because it's not the same as using a pen, um, but art tablets and digital pens are available, which could allow that. So they're an extra expense, they're an extra resource, they may be a challenge, but there may be ways to recreate that chalk and talk. But I think the important thing here is to try and understand what it is specifically about that as a teaching technique that is important. And then we can think about, are there other ways to demonstrate that kind of pedagogic approach, which don't rely on those particular technologies? So if it's just that, you know, you can write this stuff, put it up and share it, actually PowerPoint does that fine. If you want to show the process of construction, Actually, it may be that what you want to do is take a video of yourself doing that on a, a piece of the paper or something and then share that video so that you can comment on the process rather than just show the output from the process. I think this has answered our query because uh, this will be individualistic approach. And I saw uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir. Uh, sir, I think you wanted to ask something. Sir, at this point? No, no actually, I, I'm not going to ask any. There is one more question also you missed out. Uh, that is, I just wanted to mention that. Yes, uh, one, uh, some Ragini Priya Das uh, as was asking as well. From last year, we need to stay home uh, and order to work from home. Many of us did not work or unable to understand what and how to work. Immediately, it cannot be settled on. And it is all about the proper structural social engineering uh, groom government side and practice from our citizens side. But apart from this, from last two years, we have faced the actual scenario in India and facing online work difficulty. Does need better work and implementation on it so that we cannot, uh, we, we, we can be in home and work from home still. We can do better work and no hamper. Uh, we have to pay, uh, please suggest and approach it very essential for this time being like that. It's a very big question. You yeah, missed that. That's why I just uh, I read that because I wanted to read that question actually. You have any comments, uh, Dr. Martin? I can, uh... Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, this is a major problem, and I think this is where the sort of end part of my talk was focused. It's you know, we are trying to cope with a situation none of us have chosen. We've all been forced into this. Some people have more resources available to them to cope than others, and I think we do need to be attentive to what people are being asked to do and whether or not it's reasonable to carry on asking them to do it. Um, the place where I work, we've had to have some quite difficult conversations about what work we're going to stop. Things we've just decided it's not possible to do that. We will not ask people to do this. Other work where it will, it will be possible, but it will be harder. So, you know, we're going to ask you to carry on doing it, but we recognize it will take you more time. So we're going to ask you to do less of it. And then other work actually is going to be easier. So again, I sort of mentioned things like reading and sometimes writing. In those cases, we might expect you to do more of that or to do the same amount, but use some of the time that you've saved because it's easier now to do something else instead. So I think we need to have a really careful conversation about the areas of academic work we're asking people to engage with. And in our case, we have had to do things like, um, you know, set aside a portion of our budget for the year to buy and send equipment to people so that they can do certain things we need them to do. So buying them, sending them a laptop where they didn't have a computer at home or um, buying them a webcam so that they can be seen by their students and sending that to them. So, you know, sometimes there does need to be direct investment of resources in order to make these things possible. And obviously resources are limited. You know, much as I might wish we could just send everyone everything they need. At some point we do need to make decisions about this is something we'd love to do but we cannot do it now because we can't afford to do it we haven't got the resources to do it it would take too long to do it so there is unfortunately always this sort of we can improvise certain things we can achieve other things which may not have been possible before but there will be compromises that people need to make 
Yes. One more question is very interesting. I just wanted to put that question whether uh, you have seen it or not. Is it better? One from uh, Ramarao Bollamudi, Dr. Ramarao Bollamudi is saying, uh, is it better we, if we make video with the music to break the monotonous delivery of lecture? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting question. Um, Very interesting question. Well, uh, if you think your lectures are monotonous, <laughs> then perhaps you might need something to spice them up. But I think one of the things that's quite, um, one of the things that's interesting about Diana Lorillard's um, analysis is um, you can use it to analyze different levels of education, different scales of education. So you can use it to analyze a lecture. You can use it to analyze a whole course. You can use it to analyze the entire degree and look at, well, over the whole degree, is there a good balance? Or in this lecture, is there a good balance? So it might be the point of a lecture is just to provide people with information. And that's fine because then it's followed by a seminar where people get to discuss it. And then some, you know, so it could be part of a bigger picture. But I think if you look at a lecture and you think, actually, this is all talking, what can I do to break things up? What can I do, for example, halfway through to, to get people active again by talking to someone next to them or trying some idea out? And even in an online format, there may be things which we can do to set as tasks. You know, for example, um, there's online software platforms you can access through a web page which do questions, polls, to sort of see, well, how many of the audience think this? How many think that? Or to ask questions and see, well, you know, if we've got 100 people in the audience, how many people assume this? And then you can address that. If it's a misconception, you can say, well, actually, this is really interesting. You know, 33% of you have, have seemed to have this misconception. The reason this is a misconception is because, and that sort of builds back in some sense of feedback and dialogue, which might help to break things up. So I think there's a question here. What I'm cautious about is saying that we all need to pre be professional broadcasters. I don't think we do. You know, there are certain companies and certain universities, for example, the Open University in the UK does have a broadcast quality studio, but only some of their material is produced there. A lot of their stuff is done either through text or through sort of um, online discussion fora or by people doing desktop video conferencing as we're doing now. So I don't think we should expect too much of ourselves to be professional broadcasters. I think we just have to be sincere in our love of the subject and communicate that enthusiasm to the audience and engage them in a conversation about it. Actually, this, there is one person interesting. I just wanted to add something also for that person. How we can develop MCQ based questions on open book evaluation. I just wanted to add to this uh, in your uh, idea whether open book evaluation system is good or uh, multiple choice questions uh, are uh, better in the case of uh, online examination, which one is better? Because uh, we cannot have a certain system like people uh, using some kind of a help and uh, other things, no? In during online evaluation system, though web cameras are there, there is some problem and uh, kind of uh, cheating system will be there. So better, uh, better we make it open evaluation, open book evaluation, uh, so and uh, reduce the time and uh, test the ability of the candidate. This is one of the context going on discussion. So what is your opinion about uh, open book evaluation, giving, uh, allowing candidate to see whatever the material is available and also multiple choice questions uh, without giving any kind of uh, uh, independence to uh, take the book or other things uh, for verification. Which one will be good for your... Uh, uh, <laughs> I think the points you've made are very wise. I think you've raised some really important issues with this. So multiple choice questions tend to be very easy to do for large groups. And I think, you know, as you say, that, that they, they may be easy to cheese on. You know, they can circulate the answers or there are ways to design adaptive multiple choice. There are some designs of multiple choice that can test sort of more conceptual understanding, but they're very hard to do. So multiple choice tends to be really good at testing basic information. So have they understood and particularly for formative or diagnostic purposes. So if this is something which is done, for example, early on in a course to see, okay, so I've covered the first part of the material, have the basic ideas been understood? It might be useful to the teacher to know that actually all the classes fail to understand this concept. Maybe I need to think differently about how I've taught that. Um, but whether it's the best way to examine them for the summative part of the course, whether it's the part their grades are attached to, I think there are many problems with that. Um, an open book exam enables you to do a different kind of production of knowledge. 
So you're working with a range of resources in order to generate something which might be distinctive, might be new, might be personalized, might be very specific to your own lived experience and therefore harder to cheat on because, yeah, you could commission someone to write that essay. We can't make this cheating proof. Um, but it would probably there comes a point at which it's, it's more effort or more cost to get someone else to do it than it is just to do it yourself, be honest about it. So personally, I tend to lean towards open book examinations, um, but that's partly because I'm working in a particular kind of context. I'm based in education. A lot of the stuff is about professional experience. It's very much about understanding what experience people have had and relating that to ideas. So it's, it's quite hard to copy yes. because it's all very individual. And that, that isn't true for all subjects. So, you know, I think generally speaking, multiple choice, great for formative and diagnostic purposes, not so good for summative assessment, but there will be exceptions. I, I just uh, put in a different way also recently in one of the examination system I saw uh, uh, that is, uh, multi, that is um, a descriptive type with the narrating a passage and giving some questions on that passage. And yes. I, observed, I observed that particular situation. The passage questions are actually are not related to the passage and they have given uh, questions which are actually impossible to read the passage and answer it. And uh, they need to have a comprehensive knowledge about the particular subject. Uh, by just reading passage, they cannot answer it. This is what actually very cleverly asked that particular uh, narration of the passage and uh, MC questions uh, basing on the pa passage. So this yeah. seems to be better uh, than MC MCQ questions. This is what my feeling is. Yes, I think that makes a lot of sense because it is testing that broader understanding rather than just recall of specific points. Yes. Uh -huh. So if we're looking to challenge our students, which, you know, as an outcome from a higher education rather than as part of school education, I think is appropriate to do, that seems like an interesting way to do it. Yes. Hey, just uh, there are some more questions you can go ahead. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you, are you going to read or I, shall I, that is, it is very difficult to take timely exams in online mode which is possible in offline mode. How to counter this problem and conduct exams online per student, but in a requisition amount of time for correct and unbiased evaluation? So, I mean, I'm quite happy to try and answer some of these questions in the in the chat. Um, yeah. If we want to move to the next speaker, I think... Um, yes, 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 okay. Yeah. I think uh, we can continue with the next speaker and... Uh, in the, at the end, sir, if it is uh, Dr. Martin is there, you can ask some questions like that. Huh? Okay, in chat. I'll try and answer as we go. Ah, yeah. Yes, yes. Ah. You can go ahead with second speaker, uh, uh, Linda and uh, Nitu. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Professor Martin. And I would like uh, Professor Linda to now call the next speaker. But we have plenty of questions reserved for you, sir. <laughs> Yes, yes, you, can, uh, you can ask later, but uh, sir, Dr. Martin has promised you that he will remind me with the second speaker also. So you okay. can ask questions at the end. Okay, sir. Professor Linda, please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Okay. Am I audible to you all? Yes, perfectly. So, uh, Professor Nagarjun, if you would kindly unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, you so can much. you hear me? Uh, this is, yes, I hope. Uh, yeah, so all right. It's lovely yeah. to hear your voice, sir. And yeah. uh, for the rest of us, Professor Nagarjun is not a stranger to Mizoram, and he has had some previous interactions with the university itself. I would like to remind our fellow delegates of that. And he is retired, but he is still very much in the academic field. He is still guiding his research scholars, and he is also still interested and very much active in academic pursuits like that of today. He was the professor, senior professor in Homi Baba Center for Scientific Education. He is interested in the dynamics of knowledge, nature, life, and evolution. And without uh, going ahead, I would like to immediately invite him to speak. Sir, if it is all right with you, if it is okay from your side, I would be pleased to invite you to speak on rethinking evaluation. Yeah, th thank you so much, Linda, for the kind introduction. And uh, I would just uh, solve the technical aspect. So I'm able to share the screen, right? I'm permitted to share the screen. Yes. I hope, uh, yeah, all right. So. 
Uh, can you see the screen now? Yes, Very All much. right. Yeah. Okay. So um, I took a little liberty to slightly change uh, the topic, but uh, I will certainly keep the focus on reimagination because it's important to understand uh, why are we doing evaluation? And you know, unless the goals of our education are not very clear, then you know the, the evaluation that we do might not always work. So, so keeping that in mind, I just thought that uh, I, we need to add certain things uh, to that. In addition to that, I uh, also wanted to make sure that my presentation is a little more focused on the specific problems that Indian uh, education uh, system certainly needs to address. Uh, uh, some of the things may be global concerns, but uh, certain things are certainly very specific to Indian, Indian context. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we have heard uh, uh, Martin and uh, also mentioned a number of times uh, how important feedback is. Uh, and of course, evaluation, when you ask this question about evaluation, we always have to think about it, you know, it, it is for whom, whom are we? Uh, uh, is the, and also we have to think about is the feedback for the teacher, is the feedback for the student, or is the feedback for the university? You know, wh what are we, uh, what are we examining it for? And uh, to a large extent in India, uh, most of the examination and evaluation is meant for filtering purpose, like, you know, to, to create some kind of success and failure rather than actually giving them any feedback. And why is the feedback is very important uh, to my mind is also because, you know, uh, the, the manner in which uh, we are conducting our evaluation in the country, uh, I would call it a delayed feedback. Uh, because, you know, we have either semester or yearly examinations and in the process, there's very little focus on regular, you know, feedback, uh, you know, moment to moment feedback. Uh, that uh, is possible. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, Martin also talked about uh, Larry Lott's work and particularly education uh, through conversation. And in fact, when you are actually having conversation with people, you know, we always give enormous amount of feedback and that's immediate. And that immediate feedback is so important, uh, not only for assessment, but it also gives us an assessment to the speaker, like as a teacher, because teacher also gets feedback in the process because uh, we need to know whether students experiences, uh, student, whether the student is learning or not. So in a sense, uh, the way and the kind of philosophical perspective that I adopt is something like this, that you know, uh, we have to think in terms of uh, uh, evaluation and if the student cannot evaluate uh, his or her own uh, understanding, then there's something wrong in what we are doing. I will try to exemplify that with uh, certain examples uh, uh, as we go on. So I also would like to uh, do a little bit of reality check uh, because you know uh, this is India, right? Uh, and so we need to get some kind of facts uh, uh, before us, because we need to address some of these problems while we are actually uh, participating in this uh, academic work. So in this, of course, we have to ask these questions of both the kinds. Uh, we need to understand the goals as well as uh, where we are today. So I wanted to say a few things about where we are today. Uh, and, uh, and we have, this, these are the goals that uh, a lot of people talk about. Uh, and these are very well known. So uh, these are like some kind of really uh, interesting kinds of goals. And if you see this, you, you would see some interesting trend. And the trend is that it's not only about curriculum and it's not only about content, but there are so many other uh, life skills and career skills and you know soft skills and digital literacy skills and learning and innovation skills that we are actually talking about for the 21st century learning, the current context. However, most of the time when we are trying to evaluate, 
we're not evaluating most of these things because they, we consider them as mostly extraneous to our academic uh, aspects. We are only focusing on conceptual understanding, problem solving, and uh, you know, uh, it's because it's convenient to uh, evaluate information. So we always focus a lot on information. As a result, I mean, these are really uh, the core issues. So are we getting ready for this kind of thing? And that is one of the reasons why I thought that uh, reimagining uh, uh, evaluation is one of the most important uh, aspects uh, for today. So um, we should not forget uh, some of these uh, larger goals because you know academy is not isolated from the, the very social demands uh, that we have in front of us. So this is just an example because these goals are attained after a lot of deliberation across the globe. And uh, so we should keep this in mind. So uh, whatever we are teaching, uh, what, whether it is content or not, so we have to evaluate our own content, uh, our own curriculum. Is that cur curriculum actually going to address uh, any of these sustainable development goals? Uh, this kind of evaluation is for our, our own practice, whatever we are actually doing. So, so let me uh, uh, answer, uh, I mean, that's a little bit about the goals, but uh, let me uh, look at this, particularly keeping in mind uh, about India today. You know, where are we? You know, if you ask this question, for example, uh, I have a given a link here. Uh, I would not go to uh, visit that link, but I'm just asking this as a kind of a question, like, and a small message that uh, I wanted to uh, talk about here. So. Are we by, uh, we have a large number of universities across the country and, uh, and these universities, are they producing produce, consumers or producers? I think that's a very important question to ask. Uh, to give an indication, uh, if you actually look at the uh, top 20 countries of the internet users, uh, you can actually uh, visit that site on your own. And if you see that on the very top, you will see three countries, uh, United States, India, and China. These are the top three internet users. And when it comes to the content that is uploaded on the internet, uh, in terms of uh, you know, the top uh, producers of internet content, India doesn't stand anywhere in the top 20. But when it comes to consumption of the content on the internet, whether it's Wikipedia content or you know, any other uh, web content that you actually talk about, uh, I'm sort of excluding some of, a lot of content that is being produced by Indians on Facebook and internet and Instagram and uh, YouTube, et cetera. I'm talking about academic content. And similarly, when you go and look at uh, wikipedia.org and try to look at, uh, you know, which are the languages in which uh, content is actually produced. If you see, even if all the Indian languages are put together, we don't have a million pages on Wikipedia, which is a tragic situation because you have a scope to edit those pages. But most of the academics in India and even abroad do not think that Wikipedia is actually the place where uh, we should be editing. Uh, well, uh, a lot of people say that, you know, Wikipedia has a lot of mistakes, a lot of corrections uh, uh, required and things like that. And the only reason why those mistakes are not corrected is because the academicians consider Wikipedia is not going to give them the credits that are required to put in their biodata. Because, you know, if you correct a Wikipedia, you can't put, say that, you know, you can't edit, you know, I made 20 corrections and Wikipedia doesn't give you a promotion in academic things. But then if we, can, we cannot even discourage students from saying that, you know, you should not go and visit Wikipedia pages because, you know, that's what they land on every day. So it's our responsibility to correct uh, those Wikipedia pages. And particularly the reason why I'm saying about Wikipedia is because it's a, it's a wonderful index to tell which countries are producers uh, and which, uh, what kind of education these countries are giving, which actually are making producers, because most of the time it is the students and the youth who are editing the Wikipedia pages. 
and, and that's a very important uh, statistics that we can actually learn and find out. And similarly, you know, even if you ask this question, you know, where do world software developers live? Uh, you know, a lot of people think that India is very good when it comes to software development. But let me tell you that even in software development, when it comes to the creative aspects of the software development, to produce uh, packages that are applications that are originally developed uh, from the country, you will actually see that uh, a lot of uh, people are actually been developing it from across the world. Uh, and Indians are mostly maintaining them or they're actually servicing those software companies uh, in terms of you know, uh, uh, you know, call center uh, support and things like that. So it is in that sense, again, you know, the service part of uh, India's uh, software industry is quite good, but when it comes to software development per se, uh, again, uh, there is less uh, development. So the reason why I'm talking about all this is because this is a kind of a reality check. Uh, this reality check is actually going to give us an idea about, you know, what did we achieve so far in our academies? We are managing to produce a lot of consumer in the country, educated consumers in the country. Uh, educated uh, service people in the country, but we're not actually able to produce innovators. I mean, unless we produce innovators, unless we produce creative people, unless education can create creative people, we will not be able to solve the major uh, problems that our, our country is actually facing. So keeping that in mind, uh, I particularly chose to give these examples. So, uh, so now the question is now, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the evaluation system comes in right here. Because uh, when we are evaluating the current practices of evaluation, we are, we are actually selecting only those people who are consuming best. I mean, the consuming the textbooks, consuming the curricular material and things like that. And, and exactly those people are the ones who are graduating in this country. And when it comes to our own practices as teachers, uh, what are we doing? You know, we strictly and rigidly follow the syllabus and we actually are always in, interested in finishing the syllabus. You know, when we are trying to say we are finishing the syllabus, we're only trying to make sure that, you know, all the aspects that are listed in the curriculum are uh, completed. So our focus is on completing the syllabus, but we're not actually looking at, for example, students' experiences of that syllabus and the curriculum. You know, what are they experiencing? What is the feedback? Uh, how much time are we spending in, 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 in trying to uh, understand the student? And uh, so is the case with uh, practical uh, exams, particularly in STEM education. See, I work in a STEM education uh, institute. And so my focus and my examples may usually be from science education. But what I'm trying to say are applicable uh, universally for all subjects, actually. So, so it is in that sense that uh, you know the, even the practical exams in science are actually conducted only to test if the given protocol is followed strictly or not. But is, is that the reason why we have uh, practical exams for science? Uh, they're actually meant for creating an innovative and investigative person. So how can we have investigative uh, 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 capacity developed if we only give them a protocol uh, for each of these uh, practical examinations. So, so these are some of the problems, uh, whether it is in theoretical uh, evaluation, as we call it a theory exam and practical exam, these are the two terms that is widely used in Indian academia. And in both cases, uh, we have been failing and we are only testing uh, to produce a consumer uh, oriented graduate and not a creative production producer. So, uh, and of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, perceived issues in higher education, and many of them are actually to do with uh, uh, assessment, because assessment is a very important key. Uh, because, you know, if you already know what you're assessing for, people will prepare for those assessments, because it's examinations that uh, help, because ultimately, of course, uh, practically, everyone is interested to know uh, and to make sure that they're graduating. And uh, so that's actually uh, the main uh, theme uh, that you will see 
me repeating again and again uh, in this case. So uh, our higher education mostly depends on focusing on very comprehensive textbooks. Uh, so therefore we always think in the good textbooks and bad textbooks. So good textbooks are those which are comprehensive. And we again do a lot of uh, lectures and uh, uh, that means we are more, mostly focusing on course delivery and completing the syllabus and preparing students for graduation. And what are we neglecting in the whole process? So we are neglecting on uh, academic habits. And sometimes I call these academic habits as STEM habits. Uh, I'll, I'll give uh, concrete illustrations uh, a little while later. Uh, about what, why are we ignoring these academic habits? You know, developing those ignoring uh, these academic habits is possibly one of the missing uh, aspects when it comes to evaluation. Because instead of testing academic habits, we are testing uh, content uh, knowledge uh, of the students. Uh, instead of, uh, for example, uh, just give you a kind of an idea about, because I use the term, uh, if, if the student, uh, for example, uh, does the student seek evidence when uh, he comes to know about certain thing? So seeking evidence, I would consider as an academic habit. Asking a question uh, when uh, is an academic habit. Uh, critical thinking uh, is an academic habit. So these are some examples of academic habits. Of course, we have created a list of about uh, 80 such academic habits and we think that evaluation should be mostly about those academic habits and not on content per se. So, so these are uh, some of these uh, perceived issues. Of course, there are many, many uh, issues uh, that we need to talk about. Uh, I'm not in this particular talk uh, talking about uh, equity issues related to access to education and all that. That is of course a major concern of my own work, but uh, I'm not focusing on that uh, in today's uh, discussion. So what is the way out is, of course, a natural question that a lot of people will ask, like uh, how to reach sustainable excellence in any given area. So did India reach excellence in any area? And uh, can we use that as an example to learn uh, uh, things? So uh, I would like to spend about, uh, you know, uh, about five minutes, uh, maybe a little longer. I want to put together, put before you a very concrete example. This example doesn't come from academic uh, case, because there is particular area India is very famous for. And, and that is the example that I'm going to take up. Uh, so can we give academic games, uh, uh, STEM games, uh, because my interest is in STEM education. So I used STEM as an example. So can we uh, try to, uh, you know, use cricket as an example. Why cricket? Because India is on the top of the world, or at least uh, on the very top, because uh, it has certainly uh, beaten England a number of times and uh, Australia and many other cricketing uh, things. And it's always trying to be one of the best. Now, what is the reason for that? And we need to understand that not only from the point of view of the kind of uh, uh, experiences that we actually pass on to uh, our students and also the people who are participating in this game. So I also like to use the word game uh, as, a, as a metaphor uh, here, uh, because game has a lot of things for us to understand, uh, you know, what can be done, because game has some interesting, the moment you think of a game, for example, you know, what are the rules of the game is the first question that you ask. And therefore, in that sense, you know, there is the, the academics also can be played as a game and there are certain rules that you need to follow. And, uh, and understanding those rules and following those rules has to be the common knowledge of both the teachers as well as the students and all the professions who are talking about it. And that's why I want to take the cricket as an example. So one of the important thing about the game is that, you know, we play games together, you know, and that's, I think, a very important aspect about uh, uh, any game. And involvement uh, is a very important aspect of the game. And, uh, you know, you can see that all the time. You know, children, like uh, there was one question about which, you know, uh, uh, Martin was answering, like, you know, if your lecture is boring, uh, if people are not attending to it, that means you have to add some spice to it. I mean, why do you have to do that? Because you want them to involve 
uh, in the in in the engagement. So how do you get that engagement done? You know, games do it quite well, but there are certain important reasons why games do it, and that is why I'm using this as an example. And almost all games have spectators, and uh, you know, spectators are very important uh, for even academic games. This is a very important reason. You know, we have universities, and universities are closed. Uh, areas for the rest of the country, rest of the people, you know, academic environment means that there is a wall to the school or a college, and then entry to that school and college is restricted to the rest of the society. I'm actually putting a counterpoint here because people keep on talking about creating a community of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, community around. Now, how can you create a community when, uh, you know, there are no spectators. Like uh, when you when you are actually playing games, uh, <coughs> even if the people who are watching are not playing themselves, they, they actually understand and have a perception about what you're doing. And this is very important uh, for uh, accountability of academic uh, uh, practice itself. And, and this is, I think, for me, the most important point. Uh, because when since uh, the focus of uh, today's discussion is on assessment, uh, I want to talk about it. See, everyone who is playing the game also understands the rules of the game. So it's not just the professors of the universities who need to know how to evaluate the students. Students themselves need to know uh, what are the criteria of evaluation. And, and a game is a good example to know that because everyone who is not only the spectators, uh, the people who are playing the game, not only the empire of the game, everybody understands the rules of the game. And that is a very important aspect. Uh, and if, if, there is, if this is becoming difficult, it is only because we've made our academic games like that, because we focus a lot on jargon, we focus a lot on definitions, we focus a lot on various operational aspects, but not on academic habits. If you convert our academic habits into the rules of the game, then I think uh, you know everybody will understand what these academies actually are for, what are they meant for, and uh, and this is where the creativity aspect will come in. For example, particularly during the pandemic, you know there are no labs, okay, available to the students. Now, how do you do science during the pandemic? In fact, we created a fantastic example. I'll talk about it uh, later on. Uh, we have uh, a program called Cube. Uh, you can search up about it on the internet. It's called Collaboratively Understanding Biology Education. And I'll also introduce the platform where we actually do this. So we actually created a large number of home labs and, and we created home labs or frugal labs that are created uh, in the kitchen, in the drawing room, uh, or just the reading table becomes suddenly a laboratory for them. And for this, uh, this is the kind of creativity that you need. You know, anything that, that looks like a bat, uh, anything that looks like a wicket actually can become a playground, even for science. Uh, and as you can see here, in this particular case, uh, people innovate, uh, they don't have wickets, they don't have the instruments. So what do they do? Uh, they just convert whatever is available into that form because you know, people and human beings are creative by nature. They will uh, find out uh, those things. And in fact, it is because of the creativity of the students and the teachers that we managed to cope with uh, some of the things uh, during this pandemic. And uh, of course, uh, the street games are very, very inclusive. As you can see, you know, children, women, uh, everybody plays this game. And the, the reason why these games are played in every street is the reason why India is excellent in cricket. Because this particular game is played in every corner of the country. Of course, as I say, I can't say this in Mizoram. I know this very well because I visited that place and I only see football being played there. You know, for, so the street game for Mizoram would be football and not the cricket. I'm fully aware of that, but still I'm using the cricket example. I'm sorry for that. But let me tell you, I love football as well. Football could have been the example for Mizoram or maybe for Goa, maybe for Kerala, 
you know these are some states where you know football is also being played so you could use football as an example but uh, that's that's basically the way how we need to understand uh, how street games are so inclusive uh, about it and even children are so frugal in thinking about what uh, they need when they want to play this game you know they don't have protective devices and they don't need a protective device because they're actually playing with the rubber ball but still they want to imitate uh, so to speak the scientist you know the imitation is also very important uh, for learning you know so you want to have a lab coat uh, you know even if you don't need protection you, know, you, you need you need to wear it because you need to look like a scientist you know that's very important uh, for psychological uh, participation and you feel like being participated you feel like being recognized and recognition is very important uh, for uh, for any of these games that we play and i mean innovation keeps on happening and these are very important pictures for me because you know these are the creative people and when these creative people come into universities we kill that creativity and we are responsible for killing that creativity of those students and because and and then we uh, ask them to cram all the content that we teach them and then we declare them as failures i think this is something that we need to address and that is the reason why we need to reevaluate uh, our what we are doing in our academies so uh, uh, whether it is football or whether it is cricket you know what we need to do is we need to build those uh, cricket clubs or football clubs in every mohalla of the town so do we have such uh, such kind of uh, uh, you know engagements uh, out here so how how can we do this is the is the main point so for this i sort of uh, drew this uh, small caricature kind of a, a drawing here so if you actually see here uh, of course in any kind of game uh, you know uh, the bottom of the pyramid uh, is basically the, all the people of the world out there of which some of them uh, are the spectators and of those spectators uh, very few of them would be actually the player but then there are uh, very few of those some of those players who have actually happened to play the game end up becoming the referees and coaches and actually speaking most of the time the referees and coaches are not the real players uh, in fact they actually send them to the ground they don't play the game very well but then they understand how uh, whether uh, how to assess uh, the practice of the game and and that is what our job is as professors of these academies so our job is actually to understand how uh, the rules whether the players are actually following the, the rules of the game and therefore it is very important for us to actually formulate those rules of the game quite nicely so when we are reimagining the game of academics uh, we need to reimagine the rules of this game so and in india uh, i think uh one of the main problem is the lack of spectators so that's why i removed that entire block uh, from this pyramid why because most of our indian academies are completely isolated they are actually even isolated to even to industries uh you know at least to industries we should have connected uh, ourselves so we kept our our academies separated from the rest of the countries you know we we partitioned universities the entry to the university is restricted to people they can't they don't know what we are doing inside those classrooms and laboratories because we never invite them inside our spaces and that is also one reason why we get frustrated because you know there is nobody to clap what we achieve in our labs uh, i want to give you an example uh, uh, when uh, nobel prizes are announced just let me uh, think about it how many indians actually understand how many even even how many even scientists understand uh, a nobel prize from their own academic area how many times they actually do it and we have some examples of success in this area based on what we have achieved if i have time i will narrate some of those stories uh, to you uh, how to create spectators in fact uh, this is i let me tell you if your students have not become spectators for the academic work that means you are not producing them sufficiently this is our own evaluation so evaluating our own practices so uh uh in, in starting from 2017 onwards we have been experiencing this wonderful thing every year 2017 nobel prize is announced 
there are some group of people who are working with us students even school students they they have a euphoria uh, in them saying that look this nobel prize is announced uh, for the work that we are doing in our lab you know for the kind of work that we are doing in our lab so that's the kind of belongingness uh, that uh, you know comes only when you participate in in that scientific research while you are graduating in the in in the colleges and universities the the reason for that is because that we have exposed the students to investigate and when you are investigating there will be some connection to every nobel prize that is announced and that that connection is very important and that's why if we have to create spectators out of our students of the various big academic work that is happening in cricket for example we know that you know the achievers of cricket and football there are a lot of spectators i mean right now it's a football time right you know uh the game is going on and everybody is hooked on to those uh, uh, tvs and people are watching them and that's the kind of uh, thing that we have to create and if we don't create that i would consider that as an indicator of failure of academics i'm saying that this is not merely a problem in india it's also a problem all over the globe but why is it that uh, the the scientific achievements are not celebrated by all the citizens in the world and and that's a that's the reason is that you know they don't understand the practice and india possibly is the only country where scientific temper is part of the constitution you know we want to create a uh, creative uh, people who investigate and ask questions and scientific temper is one of the important uh, aspects uh, that is enshrined in the constitution that is it is a responsibility of the state to create scientific temperament among the students am, among the children among the, all the citizens uh, not just uh, the students and i think we are failing in that uh, aspect and that is one of the reasons why i specifically want to mention uh, this part okay so uh, lessons from cricket or lessons from football uh, i mean this is basically some kind of a bottom line for me is that you know every person is creative and innovative and we know that and and uh, practice practicing in a collaborative space in every street corner is something that uh, we need to achieve you know we can't just say that academics has to be done only in in isolated environments and uh, spectators feedback is a great motivator and uh, you know assessment and uh, kind of evaluation that we do if it doesn't motivate people to learn a little more then again our assessment practices are useless because giving feedback is one of the most important reasons why uh, we need to examine people and also uh, as i said earlier and i am again underlining it sharing the rules of the game uh, is very important and and uh, most of the games are very easy to enter like football you know all that you need is a ball and a, and a player uh, and collaborators uh, around and you start kicking the ball all around and uh, that's because you know the entry to that game is very easy but then to become excellent is not so easy you know and there are a lot of nuances in every game and 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 that has to happen only by practice and and that practice requires uh, uh, sharing the rules of the game to all the participants and then you know you need to keep keep uh, doing that uh, all the time okay so at this point i just wanted to know uh how i am doing with my time i think i have spent already about 35 minutes uh, uh sort of uh, so i think i will uh, uh you, you still have I, some time yeah can i can i use another 10 minutes uh, uh, yes please go ahead yeah okay so so the question of course is you know uh, the the various kinds of uh, uh, technologies that we use uh are not sufficiently not inclusive and uh, so how do you make uh, inclusivity etc uh, part of uh, our uh, uh, process and uh, uh, one of the uh, thumb rules that we normally follow in our lab is that uh, uh, whatever technology that you use the first test is to test it with not the able people but with the disabled uh, the so called people who uh, are not able to access uh, knowledge in various ways so if you if you innovate for inclusion then you know uh, we will be creating uh, our spaces and all the various tools that we use for education accessible for everyone and uh, so that's possibly 
one important uh, thumb rule uh, that we have been using uh, in, in our lab. And uh, uh, I, I would skip this uh, because this is more in the focus of inclusion uh, uh, that is prepared in a different context, not very important. Uh, uh, but now, uh, having mentioned uh, a lot of the times about uh, the need for uh, creating a spectator uh, and feeling of being a spectator, you know, which arises from feeling of being a practitioner or a player, and which also in turn arises when we understand the rules of the game and the communities of practice. So uh, uh, this is a picture that I borrowed uh, uh, from somewhere. I have the link uh, uh, later on. So what actually it shows is that, you know, the academic space has to be perforated uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, it should not be like a wall uh, that we create and entry to people from outside the practices also have to get inside so that you know when they also should be asking us questions. Uh, so it's not just a community of practice doesn't only mean that only the teachers will talk among themselves, but it should also be the teacher should be talking with uh, uh, people in the industry, people in the social spaces and uh, people uh, who are actually facing the problems because academics actually are supposed to solve those problems. So we have to evaluate ourselves uh, from uh, for those uh, projects as well. So, so this is a very wider definition of uh, what uh, communities of uh, practice uh, is uh, expected to understand. And this is a very uh, important uh, aspect about it. So I want to spend uh, a little bit of time to tell you about the CUBE story. So the CUBE actually stands for Collaboratively Understanding Biology Education. You see, I, I graduated in biology. And so I uh, have done this experiment uh, trying to see how, uh, how to play biology game like football and cricket. So that's the way how the, the CUBE uh, story has been developed as a, as a project. It's, it's a project that's going on for the last nine years uh, at our lab uh, at Homi Baba Center for Science Education. And you know, like we celebrate, uh, as you can see, one interesting aspect about the cube is that starting from school to university students and university professors, we're all working together. So that's the community. So that's the community of practice. Uh, like we don't have, uh, uh, you know, graded uh, classrooms uh, in this particular thing. Like we don't say that, you know, this is uh, for the uh, for the first year, uh, students and this is for the second year students so this is for the first semester and this is for the second semester no school students are working along with uh, undergraduate students and also some of the research students they all work together and that has been our design principle and that's how we create a community of practice uh, this is a, a photograph taken uh, when they're doing it and and we are everywhere in, in the entire country. You know, uh, of course, there are some places where we have much more uh, large number. Uh, we haven't at uh, uh, placed uh, some foothold in Mizoram, but uh, through this meeting, I'm sure uh, we are going to create one more node uh, out there. Uh, we are in Assam. Uh, uh, we're also in Sikkim, uh, but we will certainly be able to uh, participate and uh, do this. So this is a kind of an community of practice that is spread over across the country. And all these red dots that you see are the dots where the home labs have been set up during the pandemic. So, so a large number of home labs have been set up uh, uh, and these are networked clubs across the country. Uh, and this is, a, this is a picture of uh, how a reading table has been transformed into a biology lab. Okay. so. Uh, all the material that you see are frugal, just like the frugal cricket uh, and the football that you see uh, out there in every street corner. So it's just like that. So this is what I mean by a street corner lab uh, that is actually been created. Everything that you see here is actually available at home, except maybe the beaker and the conical fuss that you see here, but they're not mandatory. You can use replacements uh, for them uh, from any, any utensil from the kitchen could actually be used for them as well. So this is the kind of investigative work that we have actually been able to do even during the pandemic. 
so uh, so how how do you then uh, talk about some of these things so when you have a, a context like this at home and and when you when you are communicating with people across the country uh, okay you can have conversation in fact i am very happy uh, that uh, uh, martin uh, referred to uh, you know uh, lord lord's work and and, and and particularly the theme you know education uh, as conversation and education through conversation and this is one of our design principles so what are all these people across the country doing they are actually having conversation every day so we have what is called chat shala the chat uh, all of you know a shala in indian context would mean uh, uh, not only a classroom but also a place where you can have the chat the conversation so we have an online chat shala that happens uh, through whatsapp as well as through uh, online uh, platform that we created i will uh, show you the link of the platform uh, in a while and there we use productive investigative and creative work as a context first time education and we encourage people to create those uh, lab spaces because you know you can't create a lab uh, at home right now and for that you have to be a maker in fact uh, uh, oliver gave excellent example earlier about you know how uh, a student actually converted uh, an ipad uh, so that uh, the ipad can be used inside a bathroom because that's the most uh, uh, you know uh, peaceful place to learn uh, and 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 that's exactly when a student actually has become a maker you know so it's, it's so the, that's the way how you know the maker spirit in the student uh, actually been harnessed uh, in that particular example so that's the kind of thing that happens uh, uh, all the all the while uh, i'll i'll come back to this uh, when there are more questions because uh, I, what i wanted to say is by showing this slide i'm actually trying to say this that there are a lot of examples of the kind that we are doing across the world uh, you know uh, there was uh, also in a fields curriculum which is also uh, something that is been there which talks about uh, you know using projects as a context for stem education Uh, there are a number of examples within india and also outside where uh, this kind of examples have been talked about we don't have to i won't spend much time but these are uh, the slides that i will be passing on to you uh, so that you can actually go and look uh, at those things as well so uh, at homi baba center for example we created a curriculum for uh, uh, you know primary and elementary education where we have used some of these principles uh, so uh, to you know incorporate some of these things uh, as a part of education right in the beginning uh, and uh, uh, and similarly uh, ekalavya as an organization uh, in madhya pradesh has actually developed fantastic books uh, they are available in hindi and english uh, also uh, have a look at them about how that kind of education is concerned because at homi baba center we not only do uh, you know undergraduate education but we also do school education and these are examples from the school and for uh, uh and for sustainable uh, uh education stem practices we developed uh, what is called uh, a curriculum uh, which is issue based curriculum you know the as you can see the textbook titles actually tell you they are not chemistry they are not physics they are not uh, biology they are talking about the global problems the world is facing the population problem the land problem the ecological balance problem the health problem the climate change the health issues the education these are the problems around which the undergraduate education can happen and while these problems are being discussed you know some of the problems require chemistry expertise some of the problems need a physicist expertise some of the problems need a mathematician's expertise some of the problems need uh, you know other subject expertise and of course the computer science and various things so so this is one uh, way how uh, our uh, lab actually trying to look at uh, issues like you know how do you uh, reimagine Uh, higher education and try to look at some of these global problems that we are talking about and how can we uh, if i am learning chemistry uh, where can i use chemistry to solve these problems you know where can i use uh, uh, how do i solve the food problem for example you know uh, as a biologist or as an agricultural scientist so this is what i consider as some kind of you know activity based foundation curriculum Uh, we developed uh, an exemplary curriculum unfortunately this curriculum was developed some 12 years ago but uh, there is no single university which has come forward to implement uh, uh, a curriculum of this kind why because the assessments 
do not match with what we have developed. And that's actually the reason why we need to reimagine the assessments because there are a lot of creativity, a lot of good suggestions have come about from STEM educationists all across the country. But somehow the universities are, have actually become, uh, I would say they're not learning societies. They have actually become like immune to change. Uh, and I don't know why, because the change actually has to happen from higher, higher academies. They are the most free people in terms of the freedom that they have, because they're all autonomous organizations. So the autonomy that has been granted to them is not being used by them to even try out and to explore all these uh, uh, things. And because we need to keep on learning. And, uh, and uh, I mean, if there is one robust uh, thing that is immune to change and that has actually become the schools and colleges and how unfortunate it is that uh, the schools and colleges have become more robust. In fact, the industry is the most flexible uh, uh, social system in the country because they will crash if they don't serve the people. Now, what are we doing here as academies? If we became immune to change, then uh, we should be crashing. In fact, uh, our academies are actually not able to address most of these problems. This is particularly true in India because uh, the, uh, the higher academies uh, abroad are actually learning uh, academies, whereas we are not learning. And that is because we are not actually looking at uh, the problems and trying to transform ourselves, reimagine the kind of uh, works that we're actually doing. There's a little bit of uh, 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 interventions that are happening within the country. Uh, I'm just giving you some examples of them. You know, a lot of ICERs and NICERs uh, have come up. These are different kinds of undergraduate uh, uh, setups, uh, universities that have come up. Uh, uh, and uh, so we need to develop uh, some of these uh, uh, issues. So which issues uh, we could address? So we need to re-engineer motivation and uh, re-engineer uh, assessment. Because if assessment uh, can actually become a motivator uh, for learning, you know, if we do it properly. Uh, and how do we graduating exams and uh, all the competitive examinations that we do, you know, how do we re-engineer them such that, uh, you know, all the, uh, it, because education is a big industry in, in the country. You know, if, if the assessment changes, their industry business also will change. What I'm actually trying to say here is, for example, we have a large number of uh, coaching institutes, uh, which are private uh, across the country. Now they're all focusing on, uh, you know, the medical and engineering entrance examinations or uh, business uh, 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 examinations, uh, MBA and uh, BBA ex examinations and things like that. But if those examinations themselves focus on academic habits and not on information and not on just merely uh, conceptual understanding and content-based questions, then suddenly this entire business industry will adopt itself to those different modified examinations. So we have uh, a place to intervene. And uh, the best thing that we could do is that all the universities actually have to get together and reimagine the assessment practices and also the graduating exams that we are using. And once we do that, then the entire education ecosystem will try to adapt to those things. And that's the reason why I'm saying, you know, the key is assessment. We have to re-engineer how we have to assess ourselves, not only ourselves and also our practices and also the students' understanding and their experiences. So how do we do that? Uh, so uh, and, and keeping that in mind, uh, I have actually sort of given a kind of a thumb rule here is that, uh, uh, and that is if our students are, uh, and our practices are successful only if our students actually start appreciating the innovation that happens in the academies, in the academic world. So, uh, since uh, you know, we call uh, our classrooms as patshalas. Patshala is a Sanskrit name for the classrooms. I just want to say that you know, the the patshalas have to be, have to become chatshalas. The reason why they have to become chatshalas is because, as uh, you know, Larry Lott talks about in education uh, as conversation. 
if God, it's it's not the delivery of lessons it's not that is absolutely uh, uh, something that we have to think about uh, ourselves and that's a very important uh, aspect about it and therefore uh, i want to say that you know education should be foregrounding uh, the academic habits or the stem habits and keep the keep the content uh, you know in the in the background so uh, i would i would i would uh, i would stop here because uh, it is better that uh, you know we discuss if there are some remaining things in the in the in the question answer session and uh, i don't want to continue uh, uh, because i don't have a syllabus to complete <laughs> Thank you, Professor Nagarjun. It was a wonderful presentation and we have got insight to various aspects of evaluation. The way you explained the examples you quoted, they are the, I mean, everybody would have understood. So question and answers are there, sir, for you as well. And uh, there are plenty. Uh, one which I would like to take is the technique for comp competency-based evaluation, like someone, Dvipen Basu. Uh, from West Bengal. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, ideal technique for competency-based evaluation? Yeah, uh, and just uh, having a uh, tough time trying to find out uh, where I am. Uh, just one second. So, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, okay yeah. Uh, I, I think I'm sharing something uh, irrelevant from my screen. Stop sharing. I should stop sharing, and I'm not finding that link uh, right there. Can you? Can somebody stop sharing? Hey, okay, I found it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, because see, uh, as a, a practitioner of uh, free and open source software, I don't use Zoom for most of my yes. professional practice. Uh, I mean, I'm using it because uh, it's necessary for using it. Uh, otherwise. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, yeah. So how do we how do we focus on competency based uh, things? Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, please look at uh, one important uh, 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 small uh, innovation that we did, which is about uh, uh, STEM habits uh, at metastudio.org. Uh, so metastudio.org. Uh, I will type it uh, on the on the thing here, uh, please visit this site. Uh, yes. uh, so this is a site where you can keep searching for, uh, you know, STEM habits. Uh, and so STEM habits are also the badges that we give on this platform. Okay, so these are, so these STEM habits are, as I said, are competencies, like for example, uh, in, in cube example, I wanted to use that example so that you understand it. Like uh, an eighth, eighth grade student, uh, when he starts working with uh, 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 college students, for example, a college student, for example, says something uh, about uh, some uh, using a lot of jargon. Then the school student raises uh, his hand uh, in, the, in the group conversations and asks this question, do you have evidence for that? Okay, now this is a habit, this is a skill, and uh, this is uh, something that I would think that every educated person should be asking all the time. So this is, uh, I would consider as a very important uh, example, a specific example of how you can test it. So, so that's the way how I would look at, uh, uh, you know, evaluation based on that. So did we succeed as a teacher? To, and did we encourage the student to ask such questions? You know, for example, when a minister in the country comes and says that uh, a cow is an animal that breathes and exhales oxygen, then what are the academics in the country doing? Are they asking this question? That do you have an evidence that cow exhales oxygen? You know, so that's, that's the skill that we need uh, among our students. And, and that's the way how I would, I mean, I'm just giving a concrete example, but uh, you know, you can give a lot of examples of this kind. Another example, for example, I'm a philosophy uh, student and therefore I like this example as well. So, uh, you know, whenever a teacher comes and for example, gives uh, uh, some kind of a lecture, 
you know, teacher also makes a lot of assumptions. As a student, I would expect the assumptions also have to be declared by the teacher. Now, did the teacher declare the assumptions that the teacher is making? And if not, then the, did the student raise the hand and say, uh, can you declare the assumptions that you're making? Or ask the question, did you make this assumption teacher? Am I right in understanding that you are making this as an assumption? Because it's very important because, you know, academic practice doesn't happen unless we make some assumptions. And sometimes we have to distinguish between assumption and a hypothesis, for example. So do you recognize the difference between an assumption and a hypothesis and a fact? So I would consider the ability to distinguish between an assumption and a hypothesis and a fact is a skill. And are we assessing the student for those things? That is what I would consider as a skill-based assessment. Okay, I hope sir. I have answered uh, uh, the question. Yes, sir, you have answered. And sir, can you elaborate a little bit on badges which you just mentioned, sir? Uh, okay, so uh, uh, maybe uh, should I just uh, again share my screen and uh, take you uh, take you to uh, uh, take you to the very interesting uh, take you to this uh, concept. Uh, so let, I'm just showing you uh, Meta Studio website. I hope you're able to see the site, right? Yeah, so this is the chart shala or STEM chart games and all that that we're talking about. So this is metastudio.org site. And uh, on this site, uh, when you click on badges, okay. okay, so you will see for every action that you perform on this platform, the students receive badges. Okay, as you can see, there are a number of badges out here. We have, we are giving about 200 badges of which they've been classified into various things. And these are called STEM habits. For example, I give a badge to somebody who makes a keen observation while conversing. So he gets a keen observer badge. Sometimes people show artistic abilities, so they get uh, a badge being an artist. When they author uh, a blog uh, or they narrate a story, they get an author badge or a blogger badge. And when they declare the assumptions, they get an axiomatic badge. That is, you're, you're being an axiomatic thinker. So you found some bug in the experiment or investigation, then you get a bug finder badge. And you have used graphs uh, or geographical coordinates when you are uploaded a picture and you're actually telling that, you know, from where is this picture taken? Then you get a cartographer badge, a critical thinker badge, creative badge, collaborate, calibrator badge. So these are the badges that you get. Uh, and uh, so, and you are your evidence seeker, for example, you are seeking evidence, then you get an evidence seeker badge. You are explaining uh, when somebody is asking a question, then you get an explain, uh, explainer badge. Uh, and you have used some frugal uh, techniques in your experiment, then you get a frugal badge. Like those cricketers and footballers, you know, who, uh, you know, use those things. So, so this is the kind of badges uh, that are being given. So. Uh, you know, when you accumulate these badges onto your profile, uh, you actually become a graduate. Why not? You know, because these, these badges are given on an everyday basis. So for various things, like for example, there is a proportional thinker badge, there is a reasoner badge. So we have actually classified these badges into five different kinds. Uh, and uh, uh, I will share those things as a part of the slide so that uh, you, can, uh, you can think about them. Uh, so that you will get a little more about uh, those badges. Thank you so much, sir. This was very informative and a very new thing altogether. Uh, with the, our honorable vice chancellor, sir, pro vice chancellor, sir, are also with us. Would they like to ask at this point of time anything, sir? Uh, I don't have any questions. No, I, it is very clear for me. I, yeah. I, I only I can thank uh, Professor Nagaraj. Uh, for giving wonderful lecture for our students. Yes. And uh, you can go ahead with uh, the participants' questions. No, I, I thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Professor Srinivas. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, there is one question by pa Pawan Kumar Ray. Uh, he is asking, sir, kindly share how to convert uh, like the monotonous uh, uh, online classes into innovative uh, 
uh, aspect like innovative especially in curriculum most of the teachers follow traditional teaching not technical teaching like this is a very usual question sir but yeah, everyone yeah. is I know. stuck I know. with this sir. so yeah any... so so one thing that you do is don't do classes online <laughs> Okay. Then what you do? Then what do you do? Like we are having a conversation right now. So converse online with people. Yeah. Okay. What a what a fantastic medium this has been for conversations. You know, uh, we we have people from uh, uh, you know across the country and also from across the globe. I mean, we have Martin joining us uh, today from uh, outside the country. And why are we feeling together? Is because you know this is a conversational medium. Yes. You know, and and this is the message of the medium here. You know, uh, and uh, and and uh, what what a fantastic way to uh, have a conversation. So don't deliver lectures. There are so many lectures online. You don't have to deliver it yourself. Ask them to maybe watch a, watch a lecture and then come for a conversation here. You know, and also let me tell you, uh, please do attend uh, the chat shalas that are linked on metastudio.org. They happen from 5.30 in the evening till nine o'clock in the night. These are conducted by our students. Okay, you don't find any professors there. Of course, there are some professors who are lurking like me or someone else, uh, not to actually do anything, just to uh, you know, participate in the conversation. Maybe to ask a question or maybe to, to help them to solve a problem or something like that. And these are chat shalas that are happening every day online. So why don't you create uh, a chat shala and, uh, in, at your university asking, you know, every evening uh, or any time during the day, you know, I'm open uh, uh, from, let us say from 9 p.m. to, uh, sorry, 9 a.m. to let's say 10 a.m. Uh, you can come and have conversation with me. There is absolutely no point giving lessons because there's so many of lessons or there is no depth of lessons online. So don't try to create more. But there is depth of engagement, and that is what is our responsibility. So create that engagement, e eliminate the inhibitions that students have, eliminate the fear that students have of asking questions and having a conversation with you. I think that's the that's one of the best things to do, and uh, always make sure that uh, you know. Uh, sometimes uh, there are always some. Uh, uh, people who always dominate in that uh, uh, chat shala. So make sure that you know the silent people are also given an opportunity to speak. Some people don't speak, then they write in the chat shala. So please look at the chat window as well and try to answer those questions. Uh, if someone is inhibited to express uh, themselves, then please reply them to that. Sometimes offline conversations are also very important. Uh, because you know there are two kinds of conversations that we encourage uh, people uh, the synchronous conversations like the one that we are having right now uh, which are happening which requires everybody to be together but uh, asynchronous conversations like uh, conversations that can happen over uh, telegram whatsapp and uh, email and uh, and also on our meta studio platform for example so because you can ask a question and that question remains there for uh, whenever you want to answer. You can uh, explain things, you can uh, uh, seek uh, responses, you can provide help to people who is asking a question. So uh, this is the way uh, to, to go ahead uh, with them. So I would say, uh, please uh, um... don't give uh, lessons online. I would say that is abuse of the technology, ah, didn't, 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 not didn't, using didn't, the technology, didn't, didn't. because every technology has their affordances. Ah, One of the ah, greatest affordances of this technology is let's talk together. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your answer. Ah, okay. Must have answered the query. And, sir, I see that you are with us for constantly for two hours. I don't want to really trouble you anymore. We are also running out of time. I think, I think, uh, 
మన జనరల్ ని కొంత యువతనం ఇంటర్ మన డిజిటల్ ఛానల్ డిజిటల్ ఛానల్ మైక్ మన జనరల్ కూడా హెల్ప్ చేస్తాను అంటే మ్యూటెడ్ ను టచ్ లో ఉండొచ్చు కుడ్ యు మ్యూట్ బాబ్ సైన్స్ కూడా ఆ చేస్తాను అంటే ఒకసారి ను మాట్లాడాలి హి ఇస్ రియల్లీ బిజీ అండ్ ఇన్స్పైర్ హిస్ బిజీ షెడ్యూల్ హి హస్ కమ్ ఫర్ దిస్ ఇంటర్నేషనల్ వెబినార్ సో if there are no more questions ah da double ah double vachini nanna nanna account lo padi mail to sir and sir can answer ah, them big forward chesta sms nanna padni ah honorable vice chancellor sir ah padinde da ante nanna evaru ga anukuna evaru kattaro naaku artham kavali nanna padni double ah sir yes i have written a message i hope you will be able to read it Yeah. Uh, there is multitasking literally our respected vice chancellor is literally uh, multitasking these days taking care of the administration as well as the at- academic aspects of the university and even outside so i think it's very understandable that at this point of time he was unmuted and was um, busy uh, uh, delegating work to uh, his colleagues so uh, now that we have come to the end of our webinar a successful international webinar i would first of all like to give my heartfelt thanks to our patrons our respected vice chancellor pro vice chancellor who has been here throughout although he is silent and our convener and head of department professor h mal somi and not to mention not to forget to mention uh, professor Nagarjun and Professor Martin Oliver in his absence, uh, especially in the case of Professor Nagarjun, uh, concepts like innovating to include that every person has to be recognized as creative, uh, to know the rules, and you know the creation of home laboratories so cheap but so effective. All of these are things we are going to keep. not just keep to ourselves and you know that concept of conversing with our students not to teach them online leaving the teaching part to someone else but really truly conversing with our students those things are what i would uh, like to thank you from my own behalf but for an official uh, uh, vote of thanks i would like to invite dr neetu kaur my co organizing secretary to propose a vote of thanks thank you ma'am uh, this formal vote of thanks is very important for on my part as an organizing secretary i would like to thank all uh, i take this opportunity to first of all thank our honorable vice chancellor sir who is the guiding force and energy behind all academic endeavors such as today's webinar uh, i want to thank our honorable pro vice chancellor sir for the, his constant support and encouragement i thank our respected head of the department for her organized leadership and all kind of support she has extended to us uh, words will fall short to extend my sincere sense of uh, gratitude towards the two eminent scholarly speakers for today i'm very grateful to respected professor martin oliver who so humbly accepted our invitation and however he has left the meeting but uh, he, this message will definitely be passed to him and he has given us uh, insight into a lot of uh, experiences of students the perspectives of students which we really fail to understand at the same time i would also like to thank uh, respected professor nagarjun uh, ji sir uh, my association with him is since 2016 but uh, i was not knowing him it was professor dicky from our department who actually introduced to uh, him and then uh, he had been so kind to be with us and he is there from uh, all the beginning i really thank him from the core of my heart sir i thank you uh, very much you are here with us by your lecture today inspired us a lot and provide deep insight into students evaluation especially in this pandemic i thank you sir i thank each and every faculty member for their support at this point i would specifically like to talk about professor linda Uh, for her you know all kind of support for her time and energy which we spent together to in uh, making this program a success i thank i thank uh, uh, definitely uh, all the faculty members of department of education from our senior professor professor lal masai professor dikki professor loknath and all the young brigade we all are together and 
finally, I would like to thank uh, all the participants without whom this program would have never been a success. I'm so thankful to each and every one of you. And uh, uh, a special thanks goes to uh, the technical team. I'm in the ICT department. And a special thanks to uh, Mr. Suraj as well, who helped me with all the technical support in lab. So uh, if I've left someone, I, I really <laughs> apologize for the same. Thank you so much. I see Professor Patnaik, sir, uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir. Would you like to say something, sir? You have been with us all the way, uh, way from the beginning, but due to the tight schedule, uh, we could not like uh, ask you to just present something, sir, because we know that you will be the best person to also deliberate on this topic. So finally, I thank everyone. Yes, thank you, Dr. Neetu. And on my own behalf, I would again like to thank Dr. Neetu for being my co-organizing uh, secretary. Without her support, without her immense support, this, this international webinar would not have been possible. And I think I, would I should mention to the uh, delegates for today, the de delegates from all over the world, from outside India, different parts of India, and different parts of Mizoram as well, and also from our own beloved university. I would like to mention that it was Dr. Neetu who got in touch with our respected resource persons for today. And I'm deeply indebted to her and also to the convener, Professor H. Malsumi, and also my patrons, the vice chancellor and the pro-vice chancellor. And on that note, we would like to wish you all a good day for the remainder of the day and for remaining with us throughout the end, till the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So the participant can, can leave now. Uh, I think. So, uh, yes, I think still uh, some participants are with us. Okay, um, okay, okay. Let, let us wait for the participants to leave. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am unable to message here. We are really grateful to all the participants and delegates from all over the, uh, the country as well as outside also who have given us their precious time for this international webinar to become a success. We are really thanking them from the core of our heart. Yes. And especially at a time like this when everyone's time is so precious we all are involved as academicians. Uh, we all are involved, and in not just uh, not just uh, for our own uh, personal pursuits, but also in the academics, in evaluation. And this is exam time as well for many of the uh, universities. And yet they have taken time. And I believe there is also an orientation program going on in our own university as well. So uh, many of our colleagues have taken time to uh, join this international webinar while not missing out on the orientation as well. Ma'am, I think from our side, we can end the meeting officially. Yes, I think uh, I think it's best to end the meet and uh, Professor also me and the three of us, we can meet. Yeah, I'm ending the meeting from my side. Yes, 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 that would be wise.